Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on the Medieval Punishment Cemetery at Whitehall Road, Andover. My name is Richard Greatrex. I'm your host for tonight. So who am I? I am the head of Cotswold Archaeology's Andover Fieldwork Team, comprising of 40 archaeologists, and I was responsible for managing the fieldwork elements at the Whitehall site. I'm delighted to say that based on our bookings, we anticipate a full complement of around 1,000 attendees tonight. We're, we're getting up there. We're not quite there yet, but I'm sure by the time we've gone through all the housekeeping, we'll be pretty much there. I can see we have people attending from all over the, the world. I've seen Australia, Canada, uh, East Anglia. Um, so from all over the place. Now, before I go into the housekeeping uh, for all uh, attendees, I just want to give you a bit of a background, basic background on the development site at Way Hill. Now, because of the site's previous use as a car showroom with a relatively uh, compact industrial estate surrounding it, the uh, resulting logistical practicalities meant that it was very difficult for the client, Audi stores and their consultants planning potential to organize a prior evaluation of the site. Now that meant Effectively, when we came to uh, strip the site with the uh, main contractor, we're pretty much going in blind. Now, we did know, uh, along with the curator, that the site was located on a ridge line um, to the, uh, the west of the main uh, town of Andover, where there'd been uh, Bronze Age round barrows identified, a Roman road, and a historical administrative boundary. Uh, but um, because of the, uh, the type of construction that had taken place for the car showroom, we were thinking, probably made the assumption that uh, during that construction the, uh, and the shallowness of the site, it would be very unlikely that any remains would survive. However, as you'll find out in the presentation tonight, that, uh, the remains actually were remarkable. Before the presentation, I'll just introduce our main speaker, Sharon Clough. Uh, she'll be joined later on during the Q&A by Karen Walker, but I'll introduce Karen just before the Q&A. Now, Sharon is our human remains specialist and has uh, worked for Cotswold Archaeology for a long time. She has more than 20 years experience and she's worked on projects from uh, all over the UK. And now uh, you might also recognize her for those, of you, for those of you that watch it, as she's recently been on Digging in Britain. Now, for, before I ask uh, Sharon to get started, just a reminder that obviously, during the presentation, obviously, there'll be images of uh, human burials, uh, graphic descriptions of medieval crimes and punishments, and obviously the results of those on uh, the human remains. So please be aware of that. And, uh, and uh, well, it's, it's over to Sharon and uh, please enjoy. Well, thank you, Richard, um, and welcome everybody to this evening's talk on the Wayhill Road excavations that took place in Andover. And um, I just want you to just take a minute to have a look at this wonderful image uh, that we commissioned by the illustrator Mark Gridley. Um, this adorns the cover of the publication as well. And I'm going to come back to this image later, but as I say, it's got all the aspects of the talk tonight are in there. Um, and I'm, you'll sort of fully understand the significance of them as I go through the talk. So, you know, we've already had a bit of background there from Richard and just also a bit more that we actually featured this uh, excavation on the Channel 4 bone detectors back in January 2020. And shortly after that, we were going to have our book launch. Um, and then unfortunately, it was just prior to lockdown. So that never happened. So here we are today instead doing a sort of slightly delay, delay, delayed version of, of the book launch. Um, and and you know, sharing our discovery with everybody who's online today. So, you know, there was no big, big fanfare back then. 
But the following talk is obviously the culmination of several people's work. It's not just me. <laughs> um, Karen Walker, who will be available later for questions. Um, obviously myself doing the uh, osteology. And um, Jeremy Cusbrook did the excavation, uh, ran the excavation, as well as all the fieldwork staff and lots of other contributors uh, to, this, to this project. So, so where is Andover, for those who don't know uh, whereabouts in the country it is, you can see there on the map where, where it's located. It's located in Hampshire, sort of up to the north of it there. Um, you can see it. And back in 2016, as Richard said, Aldi Supermarket bought the land um, and wanted to have a new store. And as part of the planning process, the archaeological condition was, was put on it. So Cosford Archaeology was present on site to conduct what we call a watching brief. And as Richard already explained earlier, for those uh, who were in the Zoom then, not much archaeology was expected, but we did think there would be something. So we knew about these old roads. We knew about this one called the Portway, which is an old Roman road, and um, another road, which is quite a significant, uh, called the Harroway. And a couple of Saxon cemeteries were located nearby. So there was some potential there. Uh, for some archaeology, although how much had been disturbed by all this later building on the site, we just didn't know. So like all the best archaeological finds, this one was actually in a car park, uh, or, although more accurately, what was become Aldi's car park. Um, as you can see, the big red arrow there pointing to the car park, uh, just where the exciting bits of archaeology were found. Should you find yourselves in Andover, Andover do feel free to go stand on that bit of ground. Um, and, you know, imagine what the results that you, that you hear about today. So this is our site. It's a sort of nice sort of rectangle shape. And you can see some uh, black features there. Um, I'll just put the pointer on. Um, so this is the Roman road. What we think the roadside ditches from. This is the line of the road coming through here. There were some sort of ditches as well, some of the sort of features going on. Um, but what was most interesting obviously was what was owned down in, in this corner here. And there's a nice name here called a hundred acre corner. Um, and that's going to be quite important later. So here we are down at the bottom end of the site. Uh, this is a say, hundred acre corner. And then we started to, after we stripped the site, we started to get these um, sort of dark blobs turning up. Um, and they were sort of suspiciously grave shaped. Um, and so what we had to do was obviously investigate these and it became um, immediately apparent that they were indeed burials. And some of the first ones that we investigated were actually double burials. So that's two people placed in a grave at the same time. And then we have this other burial, which is this one here. You can see just this, there's a leg here, but this little part here um, is actually part of a sheep. And that seems a bit unusual to have in a grave. There was a lot of later disturbance that we have a lot of the service pipes going across and you'll see those throughout the photos um, as we go forward. So what we didn't know about the burials is what date they were. And at different times in British history there are different trends in burial practice, so what you would typically expect for that period. So with them being either single graves or these double graves um, and nothing else in them, these were definitely not prehistoric because they're sort of laid out supine extended. We didn't think they were Roman. They didn't you know, have anything that was particularly Roman about them. Um, they were also unlikely to be medieval or later because by the 10th century, everybody should be buried in a churchyard. There's no church here, uh, nor had there ever been. So that left the post-Roman or the Saxon period um, or early medieval through to the medieval, but there were no grave goods other than the sheep. Now, burials in the early part of the Saxon period usually have some grave goods of some sort in this part of the country. Um, luckily for us, we did eventually find uh, a grave good. And this was found in the hand of the individual that you can see here. And it's a silver coin, a silver penny. And this dated to AD 979 to 85 and was a King Athelred II silver penny. So this meant that the burial couldn't be any earlier than that date of the coin. So this puts us into the 10th century. The burials we investig then, investigated then became stranger. 
And these, all these burials here, you can see, all look, uh, are sort of laid out as you would expect them. So, as I say, sometimes you would have a double burial. Sometimes you have people face down or prone. You've also got um, people with their hands sort of behind their backs. And here, there's a head that doesn't quite look like it's in the right place. You've also got graves intercutting each other. So you've got an earlier one that's cut by a later one here. And it's generally got an impression of being sort of slightly chaotic. Um, and, and some of the graves even were too small, like this one. As you can see, the grave's not been made quite big enough for this individual and they're being crammed in with the knees up. So it came clear that we're not really dealing with an ordinary cemetery and it was possibly starting to look what has been termed um, an execution or punishment cemetery. Now, these are a phenomenon which occur in the Saxon period, usually starting around the 7th to 8th century, um, going through to possibly the 12th, but generally they've ended, the thought is they've ended by the time of the conquest in 1066. So they have been identified all over the country, uh, predominantly though down here in the south of England, but they are as far as up here in Yorkshire. And we're down here, here in this yellow one here at Wayhill, and as you can see, there's quite a few other known cemeteries in the area. Lots of these though have been excavated quite some time ago, and so haven't had a lot of modern techniques applied to them. But they do appear to be the location of the bodies of those who have been executed as a punishment for crime. And it provides a further level of punishment by denying the dead and their families a burial place with everyone else. But also they provide a visual reminder as they're located in very specific places to everyone of the consequences of crime. So talking about location, a lot of research has been done on these special cemeteries, particularly by Andrew Reynolds, um, in his book in 2009 on Anglo-Saxon deviant burial, deviant burial customs. And what is clear is that they are located in particular places in the landscape. They feature along main roads and at points where 100 boundaries meet. Now 100 is an administrative unit from the Saxon time period. And quite often they're also sited near maybe an early mound like a Bronze Age barrow. They are at very distinctive locations in the Saxon landscape. So our site lies here, this little red line dot in the middle, and that is at the conjunction of some later borough boundaries, which are these lines here, of Foxcott, Andover, and Abbots Anne. So this is quite a sort of important location, this joining on these, these three boundaries. And as I said earlier, the other side of the road, the area is called 100 Acre Corner, and 100 as in 100 boundary. And this is thought to be the out hundred, this area here, from the main town of Andover. So that's the outside or beyond Andover area. And it's possibly where the assembly for that area um, met. It was the location where they would meet. These assemblies would be um, of local important people to discuss matters, um, which may include judicial ones. So, as we said earlier, we do have a Roman road running right through the middle of the site as well. And this is uh, likely the agar or the sort of slightly raised area down the middle with the roadside ditches. And here are our burials down in the corner, right sort of in the middle of the line of the road. But it's likely by this period that uh, the Roman road has fallen out of use at this part. Uh, it may have continued in use to the southwest. So the Roman road here, you can see, is quite an important one. Obviously, it runs down to Old Sarum and then all the way up to Silchester. And then you've also got the other one running this way down Winchester, um, Milton Hall. And here's our, and it's likely that, you know, this was an important area in the Roman period. So we are talking about the site being located in quite an auspicious place with these hundred boundaries and on, on old road lines. We've also got, as mentioned earlier, the um, Harrow Way, which runs across the top here, which is then sort of parallel almost to Wayhill Road, which is the modern road here. Um, the Harrow Way is an ancient trackway in the south of England, which runs from Seaton in Devon to Dover in Kent. So that's, quite, again, another really important um, line of communication. 
So the site is a conjunction of important roads and boundaries. But we also know from earlier excavations in the area that we do have some Saxon burial grounds not very far away called the Portway East and the Portway West. So that's this one over here and this one here. And they date from the 5th to the 8th centuries. The Portway West one, interestingly, oh, sorry, <laughs> over here, um, when we were looking at the excavation report from this, it had one prone burial and two possible decapitation burials in the same grave. And this led Nick Studley, who was writing the report, to predict that a formal execution cemetery may lie close by, um, which would be the continuation, because obviously that cemetery stopped being used, it would be the continuation from that cemetery. And then, of course, we did go and find one just here. So in the later 7th to mid 8th centuries, conversion to Christianity and the changing landscape as a result of the creation of Minster churches meant that people were moving from these sort of field cemeteries um, to becoming buried around a church. And Andover was possibly one of these Minster churches. And most parish churches have been established by the 12th century and would have an associated cemetery. So it's quite likely this is where people were then being buried after the Portway East and West use had ended. So just to put this in a little bit of political context as well, what's going on in the wider picture, what's going on in, in the rest of the country. So between the 6th and 8th centuries, there is a formation of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms um, and out of these sort of tribal and familiar territories, these sort of small shires. And that's a starting up here um, with A, and then it runs through all the way to a sort of much more un uniform country where we actually have a kingdom. Um, and this is it happens by about the 10th century. And then, of course, we have the invasion in 1066. And then into the 12th and 13th centuries, we're emerging a much more increasingly urbanised, much more organised society. And this is the political backdrop, this sort of constantly evolving change that's going on um, during the period of use of our cemetery. So why might you end up in our cemetery? So we're looking at quite an exciting time period here, which is the early development of the judicial system in this country. Um, and this is where everything sort of started, how we understand it today. And the main focus for that was group responsibility. Prevention by the local community through the tithing. So the tithing is all um, males over the age of 12 had to belong to a group of nine others, which obviously makes 10 tithing. These 10 men then are responsible for the behavior of each other. And if one of them broke the law, the others had to bring that person to court. And the sanction in order to make the system work was that if they did not, they'd all be held responsible for the crime. Payment or weir guilt um, to the victim of a crime was generally what happened um, was a common consequence or punishment for crime. The community was also held responsible if a criminal was not immediately apprehended. Anyone wronged could call upon everybody else in the community to chase the criminal simply by raising the hue and cry. And that's what this image at the top here, you can see the people chasing them, the lad here carrying a sheep. And they're all, you know, they've heard the call for help and they're all supposed to join in the chase. And if they didn't make an effort, then the whole community was held responsible for the crime and would face punishment themselves. So there are different levels um, of legal stages for trying to sort of um, work out who committed the crimes, should you actually find somebody and, and say it was them. And it, this also depended on whose land or the type of crime that was committed. And right down at the local level, you have these, uh, we were talking about earlier, these little meetings and tithe meetings, moving up to the hundred or borough, um, then the shire courts, local assemblies. But we've also got the ecclesiastical courts, the manorial courts, and at right at the top we have the king's court. So the hundred courts or moot courts, moot meaning a month, would be um, usually where you would swear oaths and conduct business similar to a parish council, but they'd also act a little bit like a magistrate's court. Shire courts, all the way up to the top, um, the king's court, um, were obviously for much sort of more serious crimes or crimes that have been committed um, directly against things belonging to the king. 
So we do have quite a few law codes that were issued and they were written down from about the 8th century. So we have some idea of what the sort of things that people got up to and what the punishments were. The justice system, though, would have been understood and sanctioned by everybody in the community um, and would follow this process. So executions were the punishment for capital crime, but this was understood by everybody and they knew this was what would happen, the consequences. Due to the location of our cemetery, right there on the Hundred Borders, it would suggest that this reflected a more local system of judicial process than, say, a regional or the Crown. Um, so it's much more likely to have been the Hundred Court, uh, given the location. Though it is worth bearing in mind that some landowners held the power to execute criminals from within their own land holdings, and these trials would not have resulted in very many death penalties, uh, but may have provided a steady stream. So why might you get the death penalty? So these are the various crimes that we know uh, you would commit and they would get um, capital punishment from the various law codes. And you can see the ones at the top there are the most obvious. So you've got murder um, and then you've got theft, robbery, arson. Um, and then as it goes down, you've got things which are unlikely to have been um, something people would have done in, let's say, this much more local, regional level to do with the church or the king um, and, and so on and so forth. Thievery, though, is, is quite likely um, to be quite one of the crimes that would have ended up with uh, execution. In Fangenthjof was the privilege granted to feudal lords to carry out summary justice on thieves within the borders of their manors or fiefs. So, you know, it was regarded with great um, distaste uh, was theft. So was this also the location of the gallows? Well, we did have some very large post pits on the site, cutting right through some of the burials in some instances. So these are the ones here in blue are these pits. This is a charnel pit. So this is where, uh, where the later burial have cut through earlier ones and they've put uh, bits that they've found into this pit. From the body positions, the hands were, looked like they were still tied. So the location of the gallows is unlikely to have been very far away. A dead body is literally a dead weight. Though from what we know in this period, they may have been temporary structures erected just for the occasion and would leave little trace. But, you know, it is entirely possible that at some period a more permanent structure was erected uh, in these places. So let's have a look at gallows. Now, hanging was called um, short drop. And it was not as you would imagine, say, from the post medieval or Victorian periods, which is much more the long drop where you fall much further. It could also be from something as simple as a tree. The images at the time show a two post structure with a ladder up the side for access. And you can see that quite clearly on here. We've got the guy standing on the ladder. And the person would, may have stood on the back of a cart or something like that, which would have then been moved away. And uh, then they would have been hung. They may have also had to have climbed up the ladder themselves. Um, and then this would result in a slow strangulation. Now we think, and I'll explain a bit more later, that burials were taking place here quite infrequently, say up to every 10 years or so. So this would make a permanent structure not necessary, but as I say, with these pits, it may be that for part of the time of the use of the cemetery, there was a structure erected here. So moving on to the decapitation burials that we have, and again, having one's head chopped off in this period was again, not quite how you had it later on when you imagine a chopping block and a large ax. In this period, a sword was commonly used. There's no chopping block. Your hands would be tied and you would be held still by the beard or hair. And you can see this rabbit here is holding his hair. The blow could come from the front, the back or the side. And the evidence we have for the location of the cuts indicate that sometimes it took repeated blows to remove the head, often chopping into the mandible or the shoulder before getting through to the neck. So, we're going to have a look at the cemetery itself and some of the analysis that we did on it. And you can see here, this is the main group. This is where they were all into cutting, lots and lots of burials, lots of activity going on. This is the Holloway that we have. Um, there were a couple of individuals buried in that. And then there's a bit of a gap here, which is 
may be a true gap or not. The burials here tend to be more heavily truncated. There was less of them preserved. So it might be that we've just lost some here to later activity. And then we have another sort of group down here. Now, due to the uncertainty about the dates of the cemetery, we commissioned 20 radiocarbon dates, which is about 16% of the total recovered population. Now, unfortunately, radiocarbon dating is not the exact science that we would like it to be. Um, and at certain points in time, there are real problems with the curve or the accuracy of the dates produced. So this is the um, mapping the various radiocarbon dates onto the uh, calibration curve. And you can see all, a lot of our dates are all clustered together in little groups. And this one here, you can see the span uh, is quite a few hundred years. These ones here, much shorter spans. So where it falls on the curve on a nice sort of stretch like this, you get a short date. And where it lands on what we call a plateau, you get a very wide date. And unfortunately, I say the majority of our dates all fell on that plateau, which was incredibly annoying. And that meant they could potentially span two to three hundred years. So we applied a technique called Bayesian analysis to try and reduce this widespread of the dates. So one of the earliest burials identified was located in the hollow way, this one here, skeleton 1112. And this potentially dates as early as the 8th century. So that's just at the end of the burials, uh, use of the site of those portway burials. But it is more likely to be the 9th century, um, although the ranges, I say, up to 200 years, um, possibly into the 10th. But the majority of our dates lie somewhere between the 9th and the 12th century. Um, when you have to remember, when I said earlier, that from what we know of the other execution sites, most of these date to the 7th to the 8th through to the 12th. So our site is starting a little bit later than most of the others. Now, the group of burials here to the east of the Ag Roman Aga are all assumed to date to the same period. So we dated you know, one in a double burial. So of course the other one has to be the same date. Um, and then there's a few others over here. Now, these are all dating to a later period and potentially date as late as the 14th century, though they are definitely the 13th century. So this is quite interesting in that they are mostly located over to the side. They are predominantly either single or double burials. None of these have been decapitated. So we're just wondering if there is some sort of time period um, the use where they stopped using this area here and started to bury the people in this location instead. This time period, 13th to 14th century, you've got much more established Norman after the Normans, uh, you've got a regularized judicial system, you've got much more influence from the church, and it was assumed that executed bodies were no longer put into these special cemeteries. And the 13th to 14th century is also, you have to sort of think about what's going on at that time period. This is the time of, say, King John or Henry III or the Edwards. And, you know, you wouldn't have thought this would still be happening, these sort of things. So we had 124 articulated individuals and, I say, a lot of disarticulated material because of all this intercutting where they dig up the previous occupant and then sort of put them back in in a sort of disarray. And this divided into 400 years, say, is the use of the cemetery. Um, you maybe you've only got one burial every three years, although obviously some of them are double burials and such like. So it may be, you know, every five or even 10 years that a burial, um, somebody's being executed and buried here. We also wanted to have a look at what these people were eating and drinking and where they grew up during their childhood. And we did this through looking at their isotopes. These are the isotopes of strontium and oxygen and carbon and nitrogen. And these are the individuals that we analysed for that. So these two charts show us that the majority were actually local to the area. So that's over here, we've got the strontium and oxygen. And these are our individuals here. And you can see they're all quite nicely grouped together. Although we do have one person who um, was clearly slightly from somewhere else. But what they aren't, which is one of the questions we asked, is they're not Vikings. 
um, because these are the results here in the grey triangles are from the Weymouth um, site of the Viking mass grave uh, and the St John's College in Oxford from the St Bride's massacre. So we definitely don't have any of those. What they were eating and drinking as well. Again, everybody's roughly having the same kind of diet, although this person seems to have a little bit more uh, protein in their diet than everybody else. But, you know, there's always one. And this little square down here is our sheep. We have to put this in in order to be able to understand the tro different trophic levels that we've got for our individuals so we can see um, just where they lie on what kind of diet that they're all having. So we need that sort of background data. So these are all our graves, as you can see. So we're looking at, you know, the majority of these people local to the area with one or two a bit further away. Um, and this is to be expected, as there are always people who move around. So of the 224 articulated individuals, um, there were probably a lot more originally buried there. As stated, there might have been some more here in the middle, but as you can see, there's a grave here and down here. They're actually going beyond the limit of our excavation, heading under the modern day Wayhill Road. So it's quite likely they're originally a lot more buried. And I say we know that because of all the charnel as well, the disarticulated bone that came out, showing that there was a previous burial there. So there would have been a lot more originally buried at this site. So having a look at the individuals themselves, doing the osteology on them, I wanted to know, you know, what were these people? Who were they? What ages were they? That sort of thing. And nearly all of the 124 were male. Only two skeletons and an isolated skull were found to be female. And those are the ones here in green on this chart. So you can see they're over here and here. Now, it is a sad fact that males consistently commit more crime than females, and this is across time and cultures. Now, the reasons are very complex for this, but in addition, there might be some extra sort of time period related factors as to why we might have more males in our cemetery. Because in the Saxon medieval documents, they suggest that even where women were found guilty of crime, their outcomes were different. For example, if there was a shared responsibility case, uh, they could plead that they were under the influence of the male and get off with a lighter sentence. Uh, pregnancy was obviously used to avoid the death penalty, but also the manner of death for females might have been different. They were suggested to be drowned or burned or thrown off a cliff as an alternative option, although that's not really an option in Andover, sadly, being right in the middle of the countryside. Most of our individuals were young, they were 25 years and under, um, which is completely opposite to what you would normally expect in a normal cemetery. So here we have our young people and then less, less as the age goes on. So these ones here, the older adult is the over 45 year olds. Now it's a sad fact in osteology that it's very, very difficult to age people over 45 years. So anyone in this category could be that between 45 and 100. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to tell the difference between those things. And this is the complete reverse of what you would expect, which is this red line here. This is the sort of normal curve you would expect, which means that as you get older, you're more likely to die. Uh, and we have the complete opposite of that. So the peak of incidence, as I say, was about 18 to 25. Um, and other execution sites have had similar findings. The age distribution hasn't really changed much over time. Uh, it increases in early adolescence, peaks in the early to mid 20s and then declines. And this relationship with age has been studied since the early 19th century. Um, and as I say, hasn't actually changed much to today. Now, there were two individuals in this category here, older child. Now, this is some anywhere between about six and 12. Now, unfortunately for me, these were not complete individuals, but quite small parts. So I don't have very accurate information about them uh, beyond their presence on the site. Now, it might seem quite shocking and, and strange to have young children on the site, but the age of legal responsibility was 12 years old in the pre-conquest law codes. And today, the age of criminal responsibility is 10. So the presence of such young children, though surprising, is not completely unexpected. So this is um, where I'm going to talk a bit more about the actual sort of physical evidence for execution. It's going to get a little bit more gruesome. Um, and after completing my research for this project, the cookies trail on my computer web browser was decidedly dodgy. Uh, just be careful what you Google. You might not see what you wanted to see. 
So we had 27 individuals with their hands tied at the front or the back. Uh, this is one of them here laid on the side and the hands were here together at the back. Um, we had one with the hands removed, which I'll discuss shortly. And um, we had a number of skulls that were separate from the body. And you can see them here, just sort of laid together um, all around. Now, whether these were from charnel, uh, where they'd sort of come out of a, a previous burial and just been moved, or there is a possibility that they had been placed, say, on a stake or on some kind of display um, and then put back into the ground. Unfortunately, the, there was a lot of damage at the bottom of the school, so it wasn't possible to see if there'd been anything, you know, like a stake sort of shoved through the bottom of it to be able to understand better why they were gathered together like that. So we have some um, evidence for the, for the decapitations other than you know, just the schools lying around. So we've got um, this indirect evidence. So you have obviously a body and then the school not in the right place. And then you have bodies with, with no head. <laughs> um, so these are all indirect evidence for decapitation. But we do actually have direct evidence uh, for decapitation as well. We have the cut mark locations for nine individuals and this mostly involved the third cervical vertebrae, but also the second, the fourth, and the sixth. And if you remember earlier, I said these are not um, executions that are taking place very commonly um, and with a sword. So here is some of the physical evidence. We have one individual here, SK 1349, who had more than one cut mark. And they appear to have had three different attempts to remove the head. And these are the slice marks. This is a spiral vertebrae, and this sort of flattened area is where it's been chopped through, sliced, and again here, and then a slicing across here. But they've also, um, as well as having their first, the second, third, fourth, and the fifth cervical vertebrae involved, the right mandible had a cut mark across it as well. So the chin, uh, the side of the, the sort of chin area is getting in the way of the sword. Now, the mandibles were involved in four skeletons that we could identify, um, two for the right and two for the left. So we haven't really got a side bias, one particular side that the sword is coming from um, is not apparent. So in, I say in this time period, you've probably got no professional executioner. The executions aren't taking place that often. Um, so this is not a regular occurrence. So that may explain some of the variability in the location of the cut marks. And also you have to remember um, from the images I showed earlier, these people are, are sort of bent forwards, they're not, uh, and they're just being held. So they might not necessarily be staying quite as still as someone would like in order to be able to remove the head. So what evidence do we have for hanging? Well, apart from the hands being tied, uh, which is sort of indirect evidence, um, you might have heard of the hangman's fracture. Now, this fracture is a dislocation of the posterior arch of the second um, spiral vertebra, which, as the title suggests, is supposed to occur when someone gets hung. And I've got a nice little image here showing where the break should be. Um, however, this isn't the case. You can get this fracture from other causes of which car accidents uh, feature very highly. And it doesn't also always occur for every hanging. And it's mostly where it does occur. This is for long drop and not short drop hangings. So understandably, it's quite difficult to examine ostological evidence for known hangings using short drop. Um, so I'm reliant on quite old evidence and other archaeological finds to understand the, what happens during that process. Also, cervical vertebrae are not always recovered, but where they were, I didn't identify any hangman structures. But what I did find instead were two second cervical vertebrae where the dens or the odonto process had been sheared off. And that's these two here. This is a little sticky up bit. Um, and this is the bit that's come off. This could be damage from the ground or later activity, but it could also be as a result of hanging. Odontoid fractures at this location, the mechanism of injury suggests a high velocity force. Um, with clinical cases, this has been things like falling down the stairs whilst drunk, car accidents again, um, and somebody was struck on the head by a falling tree. The resulting injury today would not necessarily be fatal, um, but probably in the past it would have been. Interestingly, though, I did find one instance in the literature from an execution in Canada in 1898 where this exact fracture had occurred. So this demonstrated this was a possibility. 
However, this is all sort of quite new stuff and I can't 100% say this is the reason that this odontoid process has been broken in this way. So although we don't have any direct osteological evidence for hanging, it is implied uh, from the hand positions, the inclusion in this cemetery, um, where there's no other evidence for the type of execution. So as I alluded to earlier, we do have an individual um, who had their hands chopped off. It was a male, 35 to 45. They were found in the grave, supine, or, which is on their back, but with the hands were absent whilst the lower arms were placed by their sides. And this is the individual here, you can see at the bottom, the arms are in a quite sort of normal position, but there's nothing on the ends of them. And once they uh, removed the skeleton, the hands were then revealed underneath the pelvis. So having been placed into the grave first, and then the body was placed on the top. The wrist bones or carpals showed clear cut marks across them, indicating where the removal had taken place. And again, this is where these little bits here are where the slice had gone through, which was across this bit of the wrist. And then you can see the, again, this is them anatomically lined up, it went through there. So this isn't across the narrowest part of the wrist, which would be slightly higher up across the radius and the ulna. This is across the slightly wider part at the bottom of your hand. Um, and what is not quite understood is why this individual is here, because in the law codes, Punishment for theft, uh, say from the Code of Inner in the 7th century or the Knut in 1016 to 35, wounding someone in the process of withholding payments to God or perjury or minting false coin, the punishment was to have your hands chopped off. It wasn't execution. So why is this individual here? Well, it's not entirely clear, but maybe the removal of the hands led to them dying. So we've got excessive blood loss or some shock. Um, or was this an extra mutilation in addition to the hanging? We can't really determine, or because the chop marks here have no sign of healing or anything like that. Um, they've happened at or around the time of death, and that's all we can say. Now, interestingly, mutilation isn't unique to this cemetery. It has also been found at other Saxon execution cemeteries. So this is something that is going on um, across all these types of cemeteries. So I've got a bit of time for a quick look at some of the pathologies. So the young age of the population of the cemetery meant that pathologies we see were, um, are mostly related to older age. These weren't present. Uh, most of them were quite healthy young men, as you would expect. They haven't died due to their ailments or a disease. They've literally been, in some cases, cut off in the prime of their lives. But we did have one um, skeleton, which is the one here, and this head's here, and then it sort of bends around, hands behind the back, and then the legs go up here, and then here. You have to ignore this limb's an extra one, and this is somebody else. Um, this individual is quite interesting. If you have a closer look at the legs, they're not quite right. There's something a bit odd about them. Now, the skeletal evidence that we have for this individual is that they were probably disabled from the waist down. So this is the left and the right femora, so that's your upper leg, the thigh bone. And these should be nice and straight and, and wide. And what we have here is all this extra bone growth going on this side. And then this one's very, very thin. There's also something uh, odd going on up here at the head of the femur. And this is um, on the left side, there was osteomyelitis and necrosis of the femoral head. And on the right, the necrosis of the femoral head and osteopenia on the shafts. So this here is just complete osteopenia is loss of bone. So there's blood supplies not getting through and the bone is dying and then it's becoming incredibly thin because the muscles aren't being used. So then the bone um, wastes away um, and becomes very, very thin. So this person wouldn't have been able to walk. There's no evidence of them you know, say, using weight bearing on the lower limbs. But what is quite incredible is that they were also they were decapitated. So we have these decapitation marks. So we've got a cut across here, the second spiracle, and then more cut marks here across the mandible. So this is quite surprising that we have somebody who literally wouldn't have been able to run away from their crime has been included um, and found guilty and punished. We also have two burials uh, who were laid side by side, 1056 and 1057. And these two had um, what we call congenital defects. Those are changes to the skeleton which have developed whilst they're in utero. These are more sort of subtle differences, uh, changes, 
um, which may or may not have been apparent at the time. And these were located in these much later groves, the 13th to 14th century ones. So 1056 had a uh, spina bifida occulta, so that's um, where the spine doesn't fully fuse across uh, at the back of the sacrum. And this is associated with a low level of folic acid, but can also be multifactorial uh, genetic environmental factors. And wouldn't necessarily be something they might have been aware of uh, during their lifetime. But the one laid next to him, 1057, had clippal file syndrome, which is where the fusion of the second and cervical second and third cervical vertebrae. And this creates a short neck, a low posterior hairline, with a sort of obviously a more limited range of motion. And it can be quite mild, but it does have a long list of associated issues. This individual also had very long clavicles, so would have had really, really broad shoulders. So he may have looked a little bit different to everybody else, um, unless they may have had some uh, soft tissue changes that are associated with the condition. And again, the one with the spina bifida, it may have affected them or it may not, it's difficult to say. So we're looking at two individuals together in the grave uh, with these sort of slightly different changes about them. And the, you have to bring to mind the sort of attitudes in the Saxon and medieval periods towards people who were a bit different. Um, and from the documents of, of the time, physical deformities were considered to be an outward representation of inner sin. Um, from the church teachings, and disability was also regarded as being closer to the monstrous and the unhuman. Now, judicial mutilation, you know, I can have with that guy with his hands strapped off, then served as a permanent reminder of the criminal status. So the disabled body became associated with the criminal. A person was more likely to be accused of crime if they were already disabled. And I just wonder if these individuals that I've highlighted here have fallen sort of victim to that. So if you look different, you are different, you must be guilty. But it's complete speculation. So we didn't have very many finds, as I say, apart from the coin, which I've already discussed. We had a few single nails. They may have been accidental inclusions. There were a couple of buckles. These are sort of very functional uh, buckles. They usually used as belt fasteners, but they can also be for straps and knives or bags. However, Looking at contemporary images of hanging, like we have here, these two jolly individuals, um, often show people wearing only shirts or tunics. Their clothing and belongings would have been forfeit as items of value. So the buckles we have here may have been uh, used as a restraint, so for, to help with the, the tying of the hands or even the legs and feet, um, and less likely to have actually come from clothing that was being worn at the time that they went into the grave. So back to our sheep, <laughs> um, we had two individuals who had been deliberately buried with the articulated parts of sheep. Um, 1036 here was a 14 to 20 year old male with a two to three year old ewe lying over the left leg. And we had 1184 that was a 45 year plus male and had the skull and the lower jaw of a two to three year old ewe on top of his prone body. This isn't, again, too unusual for these types of cemeteries. At Stockbridge Down, which is one not too far away, there was a skull of a sheep um, and at Old Dairy Cottage, again, which is another execution cemetery not too far away, uh, one of the burials had four neonatal lambs across the knees. So was this evidence for sheep stealing uh, or does this relate to Christian iconography of the Lamb of God, for example, taking away the sin? Um, or does it hark back to some slightly earlier practices where meat offerings were very often included in the grave for the afterlife? So with so few grave goods, uh, these two sheep and a coin, basically, um, the inclusion of these, though, does suggest that at the time of burial for those individuals, there were people there who weren't necessarily part of the judicial process um, and perhaps concerned about the deceased's afterlife. Um, and they were allowed to include these items. So I find that quite interesting, um, thinking about the mindset behind all of this. So what we have is clear is a burial place that's been used for up to, say, 400 years continuously against a constantly evolving political and judicial backdrop. And in a similar way to how you always find the best finds on the last day of an excavation, and just as we'd finished all our research and analysis, put all the evidence together for the publication, 
we came across an enclosure map of the area just to the south of our site. Uh, and this is it, and it's overlaid here on the uh, 19th century OS map. Um, enclosure maps were drawn up in the late 18th, 19th centuries, particularly after the Acts of Parliament, the land was being enclosed in a change to agricultural farming practices. And these maps were then drawn up and labelled with the names of the fields. And these were often quite descriptive. Um, and the field there, as you can see, just adjacent to 100 acres, this is our site in the yellow, 100 acre corner. This field here is called Gallo Field. Yeah. <laughs> so this implies that the association with the location as a place of execution had continued through oral tradition until it was written down on the map. Um, so you do get a lot of fields labelled as Gallo's Field across the country, this, um, but these often relate to much more recent sites um, and not necessarily these. So don't start looking at maps and going everywhere there's a Gallo's Field, there's, there's going to be one of these execution cemeteries. Uh, the two things aren't that directly related. Um, and just to note, we did have a look at what documentary evidence that survives from the time period. We did have a look at these. We had a look at um, the guild rules, the civic court rolls, the crown court, everything we could find in the Hampshire Record Office. Um, and unfortunately, there were no references to our site or um, punish, uh, executions as a punishment for crime. So that, that was rather sad. Um, and what we've achieved in this project is by no means the definitive works, and there are very likely to be some historical documents somewhere that may relate to the site. And I, you know, if anybody does find any, please, please do let me know. So that image I showed you at the beginning of the talk, you can now sort of understand a little bit more about it, and it should be more clear. We have the gallows here, obviously. Um, we have someone digging a grave at the top here. Uh, we have the hands being removed. Uh, decapitation, and of course, the lovely sheep. So just to sort of say, the archive and the human remains are now stored at the Hampshire Cultural Trust uh, Museum Service. Um, and that is a sort of a, a little guide and introduction to our wonderful cemetery that we had uh, at the side of Wayhill Road in Andover. So thank you for listening. Thank you for that, uh, Sharon. That was amazing talk and uh even though i you know managed the field work i just it's all it all comes back and the detail is just fascinating and i think you, you, you're very modest there i think uh, the work that you and uh karen who i introduce in a minute um did it has really changed our understanding of these type of sites and also the longevity of, of, of them you know so i think it's a really really important uh, piece of work that you've both done um, obviously, we're going to come now to the Q&A. Um, I just want to introduce, before we start that, Karen Walker. Uh, Karen's a very uh, long-term colleague of mine at various different places. Karen was the uh, principal post excavation manager for the Wayhill site and was the lead author of the book, that I'm sure we'll, we'll mention at the end. Uh, in a long archaeological career, she has researched and written reports on a wide variety of projects including the 20th century excavations at Stonehenge, the prehistoric remains from the Twyford Down near Winchester, and uh, written many wreck sites of submarines in the English coastal waters. So um, a very, very uh, broad experience that uh, Karen has. Um, now we're going to come on to the uh, question and answer. Um, so I have to try and divide it up between three of us obviously questions are coming through all the time and i'm having to to scroll down um so one of the first questions i think this you've already partly answered this one um perhaps i can give this to karen the question is how does the excavation cemetery compare to the one in stockbridge down now obviously we've partly said about the sheep but karen if you could just perhaps to say a bit more uh, yes, certainly. Um, Stockbridge Down was excavated in the um, uh, early to middle 20th century, so a lot of the modern techniques that we've been able to apply to this cemetery haven't been applied to the, the, bo the bones at Stockbridge, uh, Stockbridge Down, um, but what they 
what the, and the recording is is of a different nature to what we do, would do now. But we do have um, records that show there were a number of individuals, um, again, with some with um, decapitations and other signs that they were fairly higgledy piggledy thrown in the graves, that sort of thing. Um, again, possible uh, hands tied. And I think I'm remembering correctly, but it might have been me and Hill, but one or other of those two Stockbridge sites had um, at least one individual who appeared to have been covered over with um, a layer of flint on top. And um, one of our one of our burials had um, appeared to have had a large rock placed next to his head or possibly on his head. Um, and again, that's something that sometimes turns up in these punishment cemeteries, um, possibly to do with keeping the bodies in the grave where they're meant to be, symbolically or, or physically. So there, there are some similarities, certainly. Right. Thank you for that, Karen. That was from David. Thank you for the question, David. It's an excellent question. Um, before Rebecca asks, uh, this, perhaps this one's for Sharon. Were you able to uh, reassociate any of the skulls with the bodies which were headless? So we obviously we saw one or two of the graves quite jumbled up, maybe two or three skulls in one grave. Were these associated with headless bodies or were they just where people were just being dumped in? Yeah, unfortunately, um, because everybody was just about was male um, and of similar age, it was incredibly difficult and I wasn't able to reunite. In fact, one of the... Um, bodies that had a skull next to it, we assumed the two were actually one and the same. Um, and then we did something called peptide analysis uh, and it proved that actually the skull was female and the body was male. So yeah, it wasn't necessarily something that you, you know, just because the skull was next to the body didn't necessarily mean those were belonging to the same individual. Uh, so no, it wasn't possible to do that. Okay, Karen, um, obviously, in certainly in the early medieval period, the actual you know, sort of orientation of burials is quite important. And we've got quite a few people asking, um, was there any, you know, obviously some of them are jumbled, but is there any orientation, you know, in, you know indicative of, uh, so, you know, date or, you know, where, where they're coming from? Um, yes, in that um, the orientation for this cemetery is very different to what you would expect from a standard Christian cemetery with the west-east orientation. Um, I think I'm right in saying ours were more almost almost the opposite to that um, but there were there were different orientations and I think when Sharon put one of the maps up you would see that those 13th century ones were all a little bit more in a in lines whereas um, a lot of the earlier ones were very jumbled and, and just possibly because there were so many intercutting graves, they put a they put a grave where they could, and it didn't really matter to them what, what orientation the body was going in. Um, if they were going in with other people upside down, facing down, um, and you were cutting through earlier graves, then I think the orientation was probably not something um, because that's normally a sign of respect and religion. And this this sort of cemetery was definitely not that locale, really. Uh, again to you, Karen. Um, is there any evidence? <laughs> worry about that. Any evidence that uh, the uh, any of the uh, dead were related? Um. Well, I think I think Sharon's point. I mean, we did we we didn't have the resources to do detailed um, analysis on DNA, but I think Sharon's point about the two individuals who in a double grave who both had had um, things that would have been wrong with them. They, I, I wonder, if Sharon can tell us more whether they whether that's an indication that they may have been related. Um, well, yeah, I, I, in my head, I think I think they probably are. Um, yeah, unfortunately, at the time that we did the work on this site, uh, DNA wasn't really happening quite as it is today. Um, it was still sort of in its infancy. Uh, it's snowballed since. Um, but yeah, it wasn't within our sort of remit to be able to do that work. 
Um, but if anybody does want to put a project together, the remains are in the museum archive and they are available to other researchers. So if anybody wants to do that, feel free. Okay. Um, Sharon, for you, um, does the pathology on uh, any of the skeletons indicate occupation? Um, it's very, very difficult to determine occupation from skeletal markers. Uh, and as I said in my talk, a lot of them were very young and very sort of generally looking, healthy looking. They've not really lived long enough um, doing maybe sort of one particular trade or anything to develop those markers if, you know, even if you feel you can interpret occupation from them. Uh, so I say there wasn't really anything that would that would indicate other than, you know, they must have had fairly good lives. There was no particular signs of metabolic disease, you know, sort of nutritional deficiencies or anything like that. They were obviously eating um, and, you know, breathing lots of nice fresh air and um, that sort of thing. So there were no indications of suffering from anything like that. OK. Um, Karen, what is the interpretation of the penny in the grave? We, this attendee says, we also had a health read this, the second penny in a grave at St Mary's graveyard. Stoke Mandeville, Aylesbury. Okay. Um, there's the thing about this coin is that it's a lot later, uh, sorry, a lot earlier in date than the actual grave that it was in. So we think it would probably have been kicking around in society, being in use before it was actually deposited later in the grave. Um, also, those coins of Ethelred are really, really quite common, but coins coins that turn up in, in punishment cemeteries, there are a few, and I believe some of the, I think there are some at Stockbridge, one or other of the two Stockbridge sites, you'd have to double check. Um, but pay, possibly going back to paying the way for the afterlife or just somebody hanging on to is ill-gotten gains? We don't know. We have no way of telling. But it, it's nice to it's nice to think about possible interpretations. Yeah, I might probably answer this. There's a couple of questions about the site itself. Um, Zoe's asked, um, was the site uh, just in one corner of the other site? But the actual burial site was focused on the southwest corner of the site. But um, we did excavate the whole of the. Um, uh, site um, and we did find obviously some Iron Age enclosures uh, obviously the uh, roadside ditches the Roman road so we did do a, you know a very for, for a watching brief we did a very thorough investigation of the whole site um, we've also been asked about the pipes we've been seeing in some of the graves are they uh, earlier than the graves sadly not and um, they're all uh, Posts, there's some post medieval or modern, and they've disturbed the graves, but amazingly, very often not to a great deal. They, you know, they've you know, they've managed to miss the skeletons very often. So uh, we've been very, very, very lucky indeed. In fact, one of the pipes, I think, was one of the just missed the sheep, I think, with one of the burials. I seem to remember. Um, right, let's just see if I can get some more questions for you. Um, do you remove all the bodies when they're, where are they reburied? I think, because as far as I remember, Sharon, they're, they're stored for the time being, aren't they? Yeah, so they've all gone to the Hampshire Museum service now, um, and they're being stored there. Um, so that's, that's what happens to them when we finish looking at them osteologically, because there's awful lot more work to be done on the skeletal remains. Uh, what I do is just sort of the beginning, really. Um, so they now are available for other researchers to carry on the work that we've started. Uh, I think a lot more questions can be answered from a lot more work that can be done on them. Okay, probably more of a sheet. Sharon again. Of the individuals excavated, how many showed no evidence of body positioning, e.g. hands tied, or trauma related to punishment of or execution? Is there anything to suggest that people may just have been buried at a location but other burials were known. Uh, there is always the possibility there are individuals in there who are there not because they've been executed. So um, these would also be people who wouldn't want to be included 
with the rest of the population. So they could be sort of socially excluded uh, and not necessarily executed. Where we couldn't determine where the hands were, they, they were usually evidence for decapitation. Um, so the ones that we, have, we can't determine are usually because they've been too heavily truncated, they just remained as a skull, um, or they were too badly preserved. Uh, we didn't really have a huge amount of evidence to suggest that they were there for any other sort of particular reason. But there is always that possibility, I say, that somebody's there for, I say, social exclusion reasons uh, from the time period. OK, Karen, many of the bodies looked at being buried with some care. If they were, they were there as a result of criminal behaviour, isn't this quite surprising? Um... There were there were some graves that were of a, a reasonable depth and um, a decent size, but yeah, I think possibly people's families were there, made as as much of an effort as they could if they were allowed to bury bodies. Um, we do know from documentary evidence that towards the later end of the cemetery that there were various religious groups who took it upon themselves to go to such cemeteries and recover the bodies and bury them. So although some of the people who were doing the hanging and um, it, it, was, it was part of their duty as, as payment for rent for their land, that sort of thing, so they may not have wanted to be there and doing it, um, you know, they they had a had a duty to 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 clear up the site in the way that they were told to do so. So, yeah, I think I think it's a mixture of things. Some of those people um, were definitely thrown in with very little care in very shallow graves, and um, yeah, the 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 disturbance to the site and the later recutting and things make some of it look pretty awful. But yes, yeah, some of them clearly had been put in with uh, arms in a much more standard format and that sort of thing. So a bit of a mix again. And would a family have been able to do that or was, were they kept well away? Uh, again, I think we've got some documentary evidence to suggest that um, people did try and recover the, the bodies. Um, I think there's at least one story of somebody not being quite dead and being cut down and then taken away by the family. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it would have it, it would have um, depended. They might not all have been absolutely local. Um, I think there's some indications from documentary evidence that strangers were more likely to end up in in cemeteries because they wouldn't have anybody local to stand up for them and and stand surety for them and, and vouch for how how this was a you know not in character and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, I think if you were a stranger, you you might not have family locally to help out. That's very interesting. Um, one for Sharon. Um, this is from Max Short. A second question from Matt. Um, were the observed crushed crania related to pre-burial activities or post-burial taphonomic processes? Um, there wasn't any evidence for it being an intentional practice, so it's not. There was no bending on the bone, which would indicate that it happened at the time that the, the person went into the ground or, or the schools were put in. Um, most of it looked like what is quite typical that you get from the, just the weight of the soil uh, and taphonomic processes. So there wasn't any evidence, I say, for for this sort of what we call green bending uh, on the bone, which would occur if it was happening while the body was still fairly fresh. Okay, thank you for that. Hopefully, Mac, that uh, answers your question. So, how, Karen, how deep down were the graves encountered? Oh, I think it's more, more for you, but... Well, so... Yeah, okay. <laughs> I love yes. that. Yeah. So, um, we're probably looking at no more than about 300 mils, so 30 centimetres below, you know, ground level. So, it's we were very, very fortunate that uh, you know anything survived. Really, there, there, there was there was evidence from our from our map, looking at historic maps, that there had been a number of buildings on the site put up and taken down, and there was some terracing which had clearly taken out soil levels as well, wasn't there? Yeah, there was, and you, you saw from uh, Sharon's uh, 
figures that there was an area in, in the middle which looked like it had been slightly more truncated. So that's probably where the most of the truncation happened. But obviously, you know, you know, it's just amazing that uh, so many of the barrels survived. Um, let's just have a look at some more questions coming in. Karen, this probably for you. Would the punishment have been issued by the Shire Reef? Um, at certain times, yes, possibly um, by the by the borough uh, sheriffs. The, the local um, coroner might have declared, if 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 it was a murder thing, might have declared that this was was murder and might have been representing the king. So again, during the whole period of our cemetery, the, the legal system changed quite a lot um, and became much more formalized. So systems were intro introduced where um, processes were, were very much more formalized um, and it changed through time. But there are, there are times when it, it could well have been the Shire Reeve, it's times when it could have been um, the landowner possibly, and, and partly in certain circumstances, if a person was caught red-handed running away or was somebody who had previously been banished from the land and turned up, you could, you could um, execute them summar summarily without actually having to go through the whole formal court system. So we can't say for sure who would have, who would have um, condemned any particular individual that we had in our cemetery. Okay, I su suspect the answer to this one is going to be no, but can we uh, discern any differences in social status amongst those executed? And, uh, not at our cemetery, I would say, from, from no. documentary sources. Um, and I th think Sharon would say from the... From, from the yeah, there's, there's nothing to... There's no, we've got, I say, no grave goods, no clothing. Nothing. We've just got an um, nostalgically, you know, we all look the same <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> quite often. Um, so no, there's no. We can't tell, unfortunately. Um, what, what we what we do know is that people from all all ranks of society did end up coming at running afoul of the law. So even the king's favourite was beheaded at various times and things like that, as well as poor people struggling to make a living and and stealing to to support themselves and we do know from documentary evidence um, from other places um, that condemned people had no some of them had no goods and chattels some of them did have goods and chattels so in documents not for this cemetery but elsewhere um, we know that different levels of society and, and what sort of people might have ended up um, being punished by capital punishment Aaron, I think this was for you again. Um, my question, this is coming from Emma Grace. My question is that most of the unknown, sorry, most of the known punishment cemeteries appear to be in Hampshire and Wiltshire. That's obviously from the map we showed earlier. Does the team think that there are more punishment cemeteries to be discovered in England? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, I think um, this is a, this has raised a number of, issues um, and and brought the subject to life again which is great and I think it allows I think I think there's a lot more work to do and I think there are there are probably more to be found because we always, always, always remember always in you know remember from the films and in, in our youth sort of about highwaymen and things like that we know there's gallows all over England how were they buried close to the gallows then or was it just something that was in the earlier periods? Um, I think um, from this, the gallows in London, some of them were buried um, in, you know, in that location. Um, but um, we don't, I don't know about the rest of the country, but I do know there's a, yeah, a couple of sites where there were sort of later gallows um, in London um, where that happened. But not everybody. That just seemed to be, I don't know, for whatever reason, there, there were just a few were, but it definitely wasn't everybody who was hung there. 
Um, but you, in the later periods, you've got a say much greater influence from from the church and from sort of much more standardised um, burial activities going on. Um, so these cemeteries do tend to fall out of use. This sort of exclusion. And, uh, and from say. from later documentary I really I'm afraid I can't remember the the name of the people who wrote a fascinating study but they looked at much much later um, countrywide documentary evidence and found that um, things like gallows and gibbets and how often they were used varied wild wide quite widely between different counties over quite long periods of time so there may have been some local traditions um influencing how people were treated, what happened, where it happened, and how, how the bodies were dealt with afterwards. So I'm, I'm sure if there's that much variation in the later period, there was probably variation early on as well. So there's plenty of work for us still to do, then. Absolutely. OK, just having a look through some more questions here. Um, were cemeteries are? Hundred boundaries because that's where Wittens took place, or because they were as far away as possible from the where people lived. Karen, that's one thing you think. Um, I think and Andrew Reynolds addressed this in 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 the book, and um, yes, I think it's possible that actually Wayhill was a hundred um, meeting place. Um, and I think it was less to do with being far away from where people lived as being um, the boundary of, of different territories where different people would have responsibility and rights for um, the punishment and seeing it enforced. But also um, these they often turn up on, um, as we've said, points which are where people are going to be going past, so crossroads, roads, um, and also there's a there's a um, tendency for them to turn up near early early earlier uh, prehistoric monuments and things like that, and possibly earlier places where um, I think Andrew calls them cultic activity. So there was always there was already something a bit odd or a bit special about that place. And maybe places where people didn't want to go and and hang around. So yeah, again, we don't know exactly that relationship between the meeting place and the place you don't want to be. But certainly, it wasn't somewhere where people lived. Well, we're getting lots of questions about yeah, whether we can see the video online. That yes, it will be on our YouTube channel um, in, a, in a very short period of time. Um, I think we're probably going to send out some information, perhaps on the YouTube channel, about how to get to copies of the book. Obviously, they're, they've been in hot demand, they'll be less and less available, but I think there's still a few copies left. Um, I don't know if it'll ever go out. Karen, do you think it'll ever go out to reprint, or is that possible or not? Um, I, I have heard mutterings to that effect. Oh. Ah. But I, I don't know. Um, it, it, you know, we'll have to see. Okay. Um, uh, do we think there's any more bodies under the way Hill Road? Um, I'll answer that one uh, quite possibly. Um, they look as if they just, we did do the uh, site next door, which is the shell garage, um, but that was just a bit too far to the west to clip the cemetery. And uh, so we didn't find any more bodies there. We did actually get, get the Iron Age enclosure ditch coming through. Um, but yes, I think under the Wayhill Road, you've probably got some more, a little bit more, maybe under the, the pavement, actually. Uh, so I think this probably extends a bit further to the southwest. Um, and then you've got probably some more barrow, Bronze Age barrows beyond that. Um, will we be doing any DNA analysis, Karen? Oh, I very much doubt that we will be. Um, but as Sharon says, they are the 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 human remains are preserved in Winchester and um no doubt if somebody comes up with the resources and a, and a, and a proposal 
then um, obviously it's up to Hampshire to facilitate that or or whatever if possible in the future. Yeah. One for you, Sharon. Are there any individuals with previously healed trauma? No, curiously. Um, the sort of rate of sort of fractures and things was, was quite low. Um, there were obviously, you know, one or two sort of accidental traumas, but we're not looking at anything that would indicate any kind of more interpersonal violence or anything like that. Um, again, it, it's mostly down to the fact that they were young. They just hadn't lived long enough um, to encounter all these different things and have accidents or fights or whatever it is uh, in order to get these injuries. Um, with them all being mostly under 25, they just just hadn't had life experience in order to get them. So uh, no, that's the general answer. Okay. I think this is probably for you again, Sharon. Uh, is there any indication that any of the barrels are uh, people not local? Yeah, so as I showed in the slide when we looked at the isotopes, we do have one or two individuals who look like they were bought, they were brought up else on a different kind of geology. So when we look at the strontium and oxygen, that's indicating the water that children were drinking, which as their adult teeth are developing, um, and it's the water that's coming off the geology where they are at that time. Um, and obviously this is mostly a chalk area where they're buried. Um, so it's suggesting that they're not from around there. Um, we obviously couldn't do this on every individual. We were limited to a select few, so there may be some more. Um, but you know, this is not unusual. We know people move around in this time period. There's always, people coming and going. So it's not unsurprising that we have people who are from elsewhere. We have, um, I think a couple of them were from either Scandinavia or Northeast Europe. And one might have been from either France or Ireland. Yeah, the, the problem is it's, it's quite a vague, as I say, it's about the geology that you're from. So what it does is it gives you a result and says, it's from anywhere on this type of geology or this level of rainfall um so it can it can range a very 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 large area um and let's say that's just while the adult teeth are developing as a child um so if they then moved i don't know when they got to say 12 uh <laughs> we wouldn't be able to tell um on that one there's a lot of questions <laughs> yeah there is yeah we, we should be coming to an end in a minute and we'll just see if we've got anything that we didn't really cover in, in the uh, presentation. Or, you know, just needs fleshing out a bit. Come on there. Think. Well, you may have covered this, Sharon, but uh, Kieran's got a question here. What's their significance in the direction of the blow in execution from the front or behind, or etc.? Um, I don't think there's any significance in it. I think it indicates that there wasn't a particular way of doing it that was established. Um, it also indicates it's likely to be a different person every time. We don't have a, an executioner as such. Um, we do know, I say, from the other sites where people have been executed, say the, the Vikings down the road at Weymouth, um, they have a similar kind of cut marks where they're sort of coming from, you know, every which way. Uh, as I say, you can imagine that people are sort of being held. They're not going to stay still. You've got somebody with a little sword um, who's never done it before. You know, things are things are just going to try and just anything to try and get the head off. It's not going to be a straightforward matter, unfortunately, um, until much, much later in the time period into the medieval, post-medieval, when we started using axes and chopping blocks, which were much, much cleaner, uh, neater way of executing people. Um. Obviously, the uh, the bone survived pretty well. Is is that due to the uh, geology? That's what Caroline Caroline's uh, asked. 
Mm, yeah, so it, it can make a big difference, the type of uh, soil um, and environment, how much sort of water there is, how acidic the ground is. Um, chalk is lovely. It, it, it preserves bone pretty well. And it leaves this in a sort of quite light um, brown colour as well. Um, so, yeah, they were pretty well preserved um, where they hadn't been damaged by, you know, nature activity and things. Is there any evidence that the sheep were killed in any different way to usual slaughter practice? I I don't think there's enough of them to left to no. tell. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't. There would one looked like it was sort of like a joint of the sheep, you know, a joint of meat, and the other was sort of mostly just the head. Um, again, these are sort of quite typical parts, articulating parts that you get. Um, for varying reasons um, in similar sort of mostly earlier time periods. Um, so it didn't look like it, um, they were you know, treated in a different way. <laughs> uh, a couple of uh, attendees are asking, Karen, um, the medieval fair held in uh, Way Hill, obviously it was only closed down, I think, in the mid 20th century. Um, did it have a connection to the uh, cemetery? Um, I don't think we can prove it has a connection to the cemetery, but it, it clearly went back a long time. Um, and again, I think Andrew Reynolds discusses it, certainly raises it in, in the book as part of his looking at the, the political and, and ge geographic area locally and what we know about. So, yeah, I think it's, a, it's another area where we need to do more research, but it's certainly... Um, a, a very long standing fair. Um, yeah. I think we're just coming to an end now. Karen, this is probably for you again. What evidence? Do we have that they were viewed by the public or were they fairly closed affairs? Um, we don't know, I don't think. Uh, certainly in later periods, they were closed affairs. Uh, sorry, open affairs. So we, we really don't know about the earlier period. But um, there is some idea that part of the reason that they were done where they were was that the it it would it would act as a deterrent to people, especially if and we 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 don't have a lot of evidence that the bodies were exposed for long periods of time, um, in um, but in documentary evidence there is stories of people being hung from gibbets um, as a, as a deterrent for people passing along the road to see what happened to you if you didn't behave yourself, um, but I don't think we know especially for this particular cemetery. Okay. Yeah, um, no, there, there wasn't any, I, I didn't, I was looking for the evidence, like you say, of of these bodies being left, um, you know, on public display, and I, I, did, I couldn't find any um, at all. Um, we know that, you know, these meetings that they have, these these moots, um, you know, these were public affairs, weren't they, that where people would come together to discuss issues and such like. Um, so yeah, it, it could have been a public affair and execution, um, just to make sure that you know everybody saw justice being done, um, apart from anything else. In, out of interest, do we know if there is any sort of trackway, or apart from the Holloway, obviously, um, towards the later part of the period, that would have passed the uh, the gallows? Well, the, the Way Hill Road itself. Um, but along the Roman alignment, not on the uh, yeah. East West alignment. Do we have anything there? Like... No, there's nothing yeah. on that alignment. No, the yeah. Hollow Way, where we've got our earliest burial, um, possibly earliest burial, actually in the Hollow Way, suggests that, you know, that was there um, so people could pass. Um, but we, yeah, the Roman, they're right in the middle of the Roman Road, so we don't think it's in use. <laughs> the Hollow Way is probably going out of use. Yeah, when the first burials are going, going yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, but they, they, yeah, there must have, there must have been something to get people there. Yeah.
Okay, it's, well, it's not far from the um, Harrow Way either. Yeah, yeah, which is which was a major, which, which was a major um, prehistoric but also very medieval good. trackway. Yeah, very, very big, important road. Okay, this is the final one. The speakers, uh, um, can this cemetery and ones like it be compared to sort of prehistoric uh, bog burials? in terms of their significance and function? Ooh, um, again. Well, I think I think what I find fascinating um, about these particular types of cemeteries is that they were just for, you know, this, this short, well, in the grand scheme, short period of time um, that we felt socially that they needed to be excluded and, and placed elsewhere as this extra thing. Um, so I think they're quite, significant in that they are demonstrating that sort of ideas um, about and this emerging judicial system that we have um, about sort of how to treat people and things. So I think they're quite significant in that respect. I think bog bodies is much more of a, a ritualized process for the killing for those, whereas this is a judicial um, exercise. This is something that is being done with a particular purpose to try and uphold the law. Um, so, but they are a fascinating, absolutely fascinating phenomenon. For, say, for the quite a short period of our history that we were using these cemeteries, um, and they are scattered all over the country. I think the dominance in the south might just be to do with where we build more, where we tend to dig things up more. <laughs> um, um, it's quite, or like you say, you have a bit more regional practices as well going on in these time periods. Ideas about things. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. I'm hoping more of these places will be found. <laughs> um, and I'd like for somebody to go back and do some more radiocarbon dating on these older excavated sites because they quite possibly do date as late as ours. Uh, we just can't prove it at the moment because we haven't been able to carbon date them. Well, I'd just like to thank all our attendees today for listening in. I hope it's been informative. I'm sure it has been because I've I've, I've really enjoyed it and I, I know the story. So um, I'd like to thank Sharon and Karen for uh, the uh, talk today and uh, the question and answer. I think it's been, there. you know, I think everyone will go away and want to read the book and buy it. <laughs> um, just a reminder, obviously, that we it will be uh, viewable on YouTube very shortly. Um, and when you do leave uh, the webinar today, please, if you do, if you can take five minutes to uh, complete our short online survey and just give us some feedback, you know, what, what we've done right and what we can improve on, that'd be really helpful. If we've not uh, put your question in today, I'd really apologise, but obviously we are limited to time and uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, hopefully we've covered it in the presentation. So thank you to everybody and our guests and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon on, a, on another webinar. Okay, thank you.